I'm done for the morning for my part. So I will leave the microphone to the next session, session chair and we'll start the session. So we have two sessions, two, two presentations before the, the coffee break. And I will hand the microphone to Marcos, who is part of the local organization team. Uh, and he's part, he works here at ISAC. He's part of the data and engineering uh, division. And he's one of the guy behind ISA Sky. So Marcos, please have the microphone. That's your turn. All right, thank you, Red. Okay, so, so this is uh, an open space uh, science workshop. So we were very pleased in the technical committee to, to receive several abstracts on actual uh, scientific payloads that could be put on a CubeSat. So we will be hearing about some of these talks, uh, about some of these during the today and tomorrow. So the first talk of, the, of this session is from Javier Cubas. Uh, he's, uh, he was at the Institute of Microgravity here in the uh, Polytechnic University in Madrid, in the Aeronautical School. And he will be telling us about the formation flying and opportunity to enhance microwave cosmology with CubeSats. Please, Javier. Thank you. So, uh, hello, everybody. Um, so, uh, as Marco said, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, the possibility of use uh, CubeSats as uh, uh, as uh, instruments for calibrate the space telescopes. So uh, here we are talking about uh, how a really cheap and inexpensive uh, and small uh, CubeSat can be used uh, in order to do uh, big science. So you can use, you can improve the science of a uh, hundred of millions of telescopes with a small CubeSat carrying uh, a calibration source. So uh, I'm from uh, Polytechnic University of Madrid, but uh, we are working in this uh, together with the Institute of Physics of Cantabria in north of Spain. And uh, when we are thinking in uh, calibrating space telescopes, we are thinking in uh, the next missions that are going to be launched to uh, the second Lagrange point. And uh, there is going to be a lot of uh, there are several telescopes planned to be placed in this point in order to uh, study the cosmic microwave background polarization. Uh, everybody knows that uh, this uh, microwave background is uh, very important to know about the origins of the universe, but uh, it's also important to know the polarization of this uh, background in order to study things like uh, the physics of the inflation, uh, the number of relativistic species, and even uh, the neutrino mass, or uh, how the dark energy and the dark matter behaves. And um, why the second Lagrange point? Okay, the second Lagrange point is uh, aligned with uh, the sun and the earth. So if you place a telescope there, uh, you can uh, look uh, one entire hemisphere of the sky without any interference of the sun and the earth. And uh, of course, uh, these telescopes have to be very precise and they don't look at the entire hemisphere at the same time. They uh, use a strategy that consists in uh, rotate. They have a double rotation one around the spin axis and another precession. And if you compose that two movements, uh, you fill with the time the entire hemisphere. So uh, you, uh, if you wait uh, several crosses, finally you fill the, um, the entire hemisphere. Of course, uh, this is only half of the sky, but during the year, the telescope uh, is moving uh, with the movement of the Earth and you can um, observe the 360 degrees of the sky. And uh, these telescopes are, uh, right now, uh, this kind of telescopes, like uh, the ones are placed in a second Lagrange point, have a really, uh, really high sensitivity levels. So uh, the problem is not uh, the sensitivity of the instruments, the problem is the calibration. You have to calibrate uh, these uh, instruments very, very well. 
and uh, you need to calibrate not only the intensity, also the polarization and the radiation pattern. To calibrate the intensity is uh, easy with uh, natural sources, but uh, to calibrate the polarization is a real problem because natural uh, sources in the sky doesn't have a very well-known polarization. So we propose to use a CubeSat in order to place far away from the spacecraft uh, an artificial source to calibrate this uh, polarity. Our vision is uh, to put uh, a CubeSat in the same launcher as the telescope uh, as a piggyback and uh, at, so, at some time of the mission the, the CubeSat can be deployed, travel far away from the telescope until uh, it's in the far field, maybe uh, uh, 300 meters away. And from then, you have to control the, um, the orientation and control the position in order to be a, a calibration uh, source. Then, uh, this is a formation flying problem for the CubeSat. Uh, but, uh, so uh, you are the CubeSat, you have to stay far away from the telescope but uh, for a CubeSat, it's impossible to move uh, following this pattern with the double rotation. So the best way is just to be uh, uh, stand, stand in one place and wait until the telescope looks at you. And, uh, but uh, where place do you have to stay? Okay, uh, if this is the anti-sun direction, uh, the rotation of the telescope is completely axial symmetric around this uh, axis. So the only uh, angle that uh, is important is uh, the gamma angle. And it says if you are going to be just in this uh, direction, in the anti sun or if you are going to be in another direction. And our study says that uh, that's not very important for the access time, but uh, it's very important uh, if you think in the number of times that the telescope look points at you. If you are exactly in the anti sun direction, the telescope uh, looks at you at uh, every revolution. But if you are maybe in the normal of uh, this anti sun direction, uh, the telescope uh, sees you uh, much less times. So that affects the number of uh, the total access time for the calibration. But uh, there are other important uh, aspects. If you are uh, just in the anti sun direction, due to the geometry of the problem, the sensor always look at you in the same part of the sensor. And that's bad for calibration. Uh, so uh, maybe you need to be in another gamma angle. Then uh, the s you cross the sensor in different uh, ways, and you can calibrate the entire sensor. So this is just an example about the complication of uh, this mission. Another important thing is uh, the calibration source. It's a question, uh, does a calibration source of these capabilities fits inside a small CubeSat? And the answer is yes. Uh, these uh, calibration sources need uh, a lot of precision. They have to have uh, high pure signals with a uh, small error. And uh, they have to cover a wide band of frequencies, maybe from 40 to 400 gigahertz to calibrate all the frequencies of the sensor. But there are already studies that say that uh, you can uh, construct uh, one uh, calibration source like that, uh, and it can fit in uh, one or maybe 1.5 uh, units of a CubeSat. Uh, so um, we know uh, how we want to what kind of mission we want. We know that uh, uh, the payload fits inside a CubeSat. So uh, we are going to think about uh, the requirements, the other requirements of the mission. This kind of mission uh, needs, uh, well, the payload probably needs around uh, 30 watts. That's uh, pretty much, but uh, it's feasible for a small CubeSat. Uh, you need a really high precision in the orientation. You have to know where are you pointing, and you have to control that pointing to face the telescope. You also need to control very well your position. You have to be at uh, 300 meters and control that with maybe three meters of error. 
but uh, you have to know even better where you are. So you not only stay in one point, you also have to know uh, where you are and with a higher, uh, even a higher precision, maybe tens of centimeters. Uh, and uh, that, uh, you have to do that uh, probably for three years. The calibration is not continuous during three years. Maybe it's once time, uh, one, one time per month. And uh, thinking in this kind of problems, uh, we have identified uh, 13 uh, critical technologies, 13 things that are really difficult to be performed with uh, a CubeSat. For example, uh, the problem of uh, measuring the distance. Uh, you have to, to uh, determine the distance with dozens of centimeters of precision and you are 300 meters away. There are already uh, CubeSat missions that uh, have done that kind of uh, determination, like uh, CAN-X, but they use GPS technology and you don't have GPS uh, help in L2 point. So you have to think in another kind of, uh, of uh, another way to determine the, the distance. Maybe you can think in, um, in radar, but radar technology probably needs uh, too much uh, power for a CubeSat. So uh, this is one of the problem. Uh, maybe uh, you can use uh, uh, computer vision, just a camera trying to analyze the, the video, but 300 meters probably is uh, too high uh, distance for obtaining a precision of dozen of centimeters. So one of the problem is how to determine the, um, the distance. But uh, happily, uh, we think that the technology already exists. Uh, for example, uh, we chose uh, this kind of technology uh, to measure the ranging in the S-band and uh, they say that they can measure the distance with the precision that we need. Uh, it fits in a CubeSat and it doesn't use uh, too much power for us. Another problem is the propulsion. Making a precision formation flying with CubeSats is very difficult because uh, you need uh, really uh, precise and small uh, thrust. Uh, you have to keep uh, a small CubeSat in, uh, in a few centimeters. You need uh, really high a really small uh, thrust. And uh, you cannot use chemical for do that, for example, chemical thruster. And uh, maybe you can think in ionic propulsion, but ionic propulsion for CubeSat uh, needs uh, too much, uh, too much uh, power. So uh, uh, we were thinking more in, uh, in gas, coal gas propulsion, okay? So uh, we think that uh, the the technology exists and we think that uh, there are already missions that uh, plan to do the same. For example, Sulfro is a Chinese mission that plan to do a uh, formation flying of uh, CubeSats in L2. For example, CAN-X is a mission uh, that already have tested formation flying in, of CubeSats in uh, LEO. The problem is that they use uh, GPS. And uh, there is other missions like Proba3 that in the future probably are going to test uh, this kind of technology. So uh, we know that technology exists. We know that there are missions that uh, they are planning to do the same. So uh, the next step is to, uh, we, plan, we design the, um, a real mission. And we design this with uh, OCDT, which is a open uh, software that uh, use the ESA for concurrent design. So you can design all the subsystem at the same time. And the result is uh, this spacecraft that uh, meets all the needs that we need uh, for, the, uh, for the mission. It's, uh, everything fits in six units. Uh, we have uh, the payload, we have a big battery uh, to, do, uh, to, to maintain that uh, high level of power during the calibration. We have uh, two deployable solar panels. And uh, the most important, everything fits in only six units and uh, the weight is not uh, over the CubeSat sample. So uh, we have uh, performed, uh, we have uh, designed a CubeSat uh, with uh, open software of the ESA, and we think uh, that uh, the technology, the critical technology uh, is ready for uh, this kind of mission. S and that demonstrates that a really small uh, CubeSat 
can enhance the science of a multimillionaire uh, space telescope and uh, that, uh, okay, CubeSats are not uh, just toys. You can do big science with it, okay? And I think uh, I'm uh, out of limits, so uh, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so questions for Javier? Open for questions. Hi. So um, I couldn't see if you have considered that spacecraft in L2 actually orbited too. They are not in L2, so they are in Lee Sanjus orbit. So I couldn't see that in your simulation to see that the CubeSat is going to be in a certain point and crossing the field of view. And the second question is uh, derived from this. Uh, have you computed that, that the L2 is not stable for gravitational? So the, the CubeSat has to stay there. Mm -hmm. is, is, is enough for uh, cold gas? Yeah, that, that's one of the slides, but I didn't have time, so uh, I go very, very fast uh, over it. Uh, of course, the, the uh, L2, okay, this L2 point is not completely stable. It's pretty stable, but it's not completely stable and you have to do uh, maneuvers to stay there. But, um, and we designed, for example, that was one of the problems to design the propulsion system of the CubeSat, thinking in this, in maintaining uh, this orbit. Uh, we have uh, a study and done some simulation and the total quantity of uh, delta velocity that you need to maintain a, a Lissajous orbit is not very high. We think that maybe uh, with uh, 6.8 uh, meters per second of total delta, delta velocity is enough. In fact, uh, we think that it's much more important the quantity of delta velocity that you need for uh, the maneuvers because you cannot just stay in the same point all the time because that probably consumes uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, fuel, etc. So we are thinking in maybe uh, move during one month more freely and uh, for the calibration uh, move exactly to the point. And uh, we think that's more, much more, that maneuvers are more important in the total quantity of the time and all the time. But uh, we already estimate or calculate this, uh, these uh, velocities and uh, we choose the, the thruster thinking in, in the total quantity and we think that it can be done and it, uh, it, it fits in the six units. Okay, so. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, so for your calibration beams, what hardware were you thinking of using? Would it be gun diodes and horn antennas? Or were you looking at a different method of creating the calibration beams? Sorry, I cannot hear very much. Sorry, I'll, I'll speak closer. The calibration beams, calibration. which hardware were you looking at using for that? Uh, well, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, that's the part the Institute of Physics of Cantabria uh, is working on it. And I don't know very much about the calibration sources. I just know that uh, what uh, this slide says. Uh, okay, that uh, is going to be a, a calibration source that uh, using uh, frequency multipliers and filters uh, can uh, improve and make a. a different frequencies. And uh, we just knew that, we just know that uh, probably uh, that wide band is too, too wide for just one, uh, one uh, calibration source. So uh, we are thinking in, uh, in use uh, two different, for different frequencies. But uh, I don't know a lot of, uh, I don't know any about the calibration sources. I, I, uh, if you want to know about that, uh, maybe you can write uh, to the people of the University of Cantabria. Okay, I think uh, 
we are it tight. If it's a very quick question, and then we'll move to the maybe the next speaker can go up already. Okay. Um, I noticed that um, your your hardware was designed with some open source tools. Um, I'm just wondering if there are any other open source components you're using or are publishing as part of this project. Uh, well, in fact, um, the open source part was the um, okay. was the, the open concurrent design tool. Okay, if you want to design a, a CubeSat or a spacecraft in general, uh, you cannot design subsystem by subsystem. Because for example, the, the power subsystem affects the attitude control subsystem, or how much power do you, can you have. But the, power, the control attitude subsystem also affects the power subsystem because uh, that will determine if you point uh, better or, or worse to the sun. So uh, uh, if you want to, um, if you want to design uh, the fastest way, the, the, in the fastest way the, the satellite, the best way is to do concurrent design. You have uh, two workstations with uh, one engineer in every workstation, and all of them have to share the data and uh, interchange uh, the results and iterate until they find a solution. In fact, uh, we did that. We did that in our concurrent the same facility with uh, our students of, of the master. And uh, one of the problem is uh, the standards about uh, this concurrent design uh, software, and uh, what with kind of standards or what kind of programs do you use? And uh, we use uh, the standards, the open standards of the ESA, that gives you the software for that, that communication between workstations and also the software, the add-ins to the modules uh, in order to be able to communicate to this uh, uh, software and databases. But uh, our subsystems were designed uh, in our uh, university. The part, the open part is the, um, the concurrent design software for interchange the data. But I think that ISA also has uh, uh, modules, standard modules for uh, each subsystem. So you can design the entire CubeSat uh, with this kind of software, assuring that all the subsystems work at the same time. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Javier. Yes.